Before we get started, I want to take a minute to uh, thank one of our sponsors in particular. Grant Street Group has been one of our most faithful sponsors for Pearl events. In fact, it's hard for me to remember a Pearl event that Grant Street Group has not been a part of sponsoring. Anytime that we need something for an activity, it's great to have someone like Grant Street Group that we can always call on and say, hey, we're in a pinch, we need this, can, can you help us out? Because they are always very eager and willing to provide whatever we need. They are, they've been so supportive of the Pearl Foundation in the Pearl community, and we appreciate it so much. A, a really good example of that is for this conference, we were presented with an opportunity to get free advertising in the Linux journal to advertise this event. But we needed somebody with graphic design skills to put together an ad for us. And we only had a very short period of time to get that done. And so we called up Grant Street Group and said, do you have any designers that can help us? We need this done in a few days. And there was no problem. They, they assigned the staff, it got done, it was beautiful, and we appreciate it so much. So I want to thank Grant Street Group very much for everything that they've done to make this event a success. So thank you very much for that. And <laughs> it's now my honor to introduce Pierre Dennis, Chief Technology Officer of Grant Street Group, who will be introducing our keynote. So I'm Pierre Denis, um, Chief Technology Officer at Grand Street Group. And uh, so Grand Street Group, we, uh, make, we write software uh, to, make, to help government work better. Um, so here in Florida, we, our software processes more than 50% of the property tax being collected in the state. And, and we help uh, you know, get uh, this money to fund uh, schools and uh, uh, you know, local services, et cetera, firefighters. And, we're very committed to making this whole process and helping government being more efficient. Um, uh, Pearl is a core technology for us, and uh, we've been supporting Pearl for a long time. Uh, we have more than 50 Pearl developers, um, and, and we've been pr proud sponsor, as Dan said, of various Pearl Foundation events. And I had to actually look back because I didn't remember since when we started. And I know we started at least in 2003. And, uh, and so we really enjoy, uh, you know, uh, Pearl community, um, and we hire new developers on a regular basis because we're growing. Um, so we have a wrap roll here, and uh, make sure to go to our table to win uh, potentially uh, Apple Watch. And there is also, if you feel like it, there is a coding challenge. It's kind of hard, uh, and uh, there is an iPad Pro that uh, you know the, the winner will get. Um, so anyway, uh, now it is my honor uh, to introduce our conference's uh, keynote speaker. And uh, I remember actually uh, devouring uh, his book, um, uh, Object Oriented Pearl, back in 2000. Uh, I'm sure many of you have fond memories of that. And I have thoroughly enjoyed this mastery of Pearl, uh, I'm sure like you, and, and computer science ever since. He's the author of multiple books, uh, advanced and powerful CPAN modules, multiple winner of Larry World Awards. And Yuri just gave me, uh, told me an anecdote earlier today about uh, uh, early days of the early O'Reilly Pearl Conference, and uh, they were judging submitted uh, technical papers for the Larry Wall Award, and uh, they were stuck on two papers and uh, to, to you know to find the best one, and it's only after a while that they realized that both papers were from Damien. <laughs> um, so there's not enough time to enumerate uh, all of his accomplishments, of course. Uh, suffice it to say that his lectures are now the stuff of legend. And we are very lucky to have such a great mind in our Pearl community. Um, oh, he asked me to tell you that uh, he will be very happy to take questions or discussion points, but only at the end of the keynote, okay? So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Damien Conway. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, can I just start off by saying how great it is to be back with my tribe? I've missed you guys so much. <laughs> so
So I really think we're going to have to blame Dan Wright for what follows. I mean, you all know Dan. There's Dan. <laughs> because when we were talking about me coming back to Yapsi, he said, well, could you give a keynote on the features of Perl 6 that make life better even for beginners? So given that brief, it was completely natural that I would decide that this keynote I'm going to talk about basically all of these topics. And uh, the way I got here was I started out by asking myself, well, what is it that beginners would do with Perl 6? And I, I guess that always depends on the kind of beginners we're talking about. If they're just beginners in Perl 6, if they're used to Perl 5, for example, then I pretty much expect that you're going to be doing the same sorts of things that you do in Perl 5 in Perl 6, just enjoying it more. If you're new to Perl entirely, then it's very likely that what you're going to be doing with Perl 6 is what you were doing with whatever languages you have escaped from and just enjoying it more. But I wanted to go a little bit further than that. I think, what about people who are beginners in programming? I thought, well, where can I find a list of beginners in programming? And of course, you can find it on Wikipedia. And when you look for a list of beginners in programming, you find these names. <laughs> so I decided I would talk about what they did and what they might have been able to do if they'd had Perl 6. <laughs> So let's get started. Let's start with this lady. This is Ada King, the Countess of Lovelace. And she, of course, is famous for publishing the first ever computer algorithm. And the great thing about the internet is, if you want to see it, you can actually see it online if you want to go out there and find that. And it was fantastic, because she even had coding tables for how to run the analytical engine. So this very first algorithm was about computing Bernoulli numbers. And of course, since that particular publication, there have been better algorithms for it. And here's probably about the best of them, the uh, Akiyama Tanagawa algorithm, written in Perl 6. Now, if you're not very familiar with Perl 6, the first thing you'll notice here is how much this looks like a modern Perl 5 implementation. And in fact, there are only a few syntactic differences but I would argue those syntactic differences are valuable and make life better. So the most obvious one is we rejigged how the for loop syntax works. So in Perl 6, you say for this list of things, and then you say, and they feed into some iterator variable, which I'm going to use in the loop. So that's very, very cool. And of course, when you have your list, in Perl 6, you can do all kinds of things you can't easily do in Perl 5. You can count up from 0, which you can do in Perl 5. You can count down from M just as easily. And indeed, what we found that many people want to do is they want to count from 0 to N minus 1. So we made an operator for that. You want to count 20 times? That's what you're doing there. We think that this will decrease the use of minus 1 by about 80% in <laughs> Perl code. So the other interesting thing about this is the way this works when we are setting up the iterator variable is that that iterator variable is actually just a parameter of the block. In Perl 6, all blocks can have parameters. And so the for loop just takes two arguments, a list and a block with a parameter. And the parameter tells you what the name of the iterator variable is. If you don't give it a name, it gets an automatic parameter, and that automatic parameter is dollar underscore. The next thing I really like about Perl 6 is that none of the control structures in the language require you to put parentheses in. You still can if it makes you feel better, but it's not necessary anymore. And anything that moves us away from Lisp is a good thing. The other thing that I like about Perl 6 is we made a fundamental change in the way that you access an array or indeed a hash. So in Perl 5, if you think back to when you were learning Perl 5, maybe that was last week, maybe that was a decade ago, one of the biggest jobs of the beginner in Perl 5 is to try and work out which sigil to use. And basically the method we mostly use is I'll try all of them until one of them stops complaining. 
Well, in Perl 6, we completely change the way that works. In Perl 6, if it's an array, you use an at sign. Always. Same with hashes, always a percentage sign. Same with scalars, always a dollar sign. Lesson over. That's it. So in other words, we took this Perl 5 table of what do you use when, and we made it this table instead. So I really like that because it really does make everyone's life easier except people who are coding in both Perl 5 and Perl 6 at the same time. <laughs> Your lives will be misery. <laughs> the last thing I like is in Perl 6, if you see curly brackets, that's a block of code, even if the curly brackets happen to be inside a double quoted string. So inside a double quoted string, you come across a block of code, it executes the block of code, interpolates whatever the result was. And now, putting subroutine calls inside a double quoted string is that easy. You will never use the concatenation operator again. <laughs> so, let's run this little bit of code and see what it does. Well, what it does is compute the Bernoulli numbers. It's very exciting, I know. And if you're familiar with the Bernoulli number, it's a weird sequence. It kind of starts out sane, and then every second one decides it's going to be zero forever. And all the other ones just kind of have random values. I want you to memorize that particular list. Because <laughs> I want to show you the same thing in Perl 5. Watch carefully. That's Perl 5 version. Note how similar. Ooh, oops. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> it's a great language. So if we pull those two lists up, you'll see that some of the Perl 5 values are right, some of them are kind of right, and then things go horribly, horribly wrong because of the accumulated rounding errors. Because in Perl 5, what do we use? We use your native floating point notation to do these calculations, and as we go on in the iteration, things go horribly wrong. So why didn't it go horribly wrong in Perl 6? And to understand that, we need to look down here where I'm going to add something to the call to Bernoulli. I'm saying, when you get the value back, show it to me as if it was Perl source code. Basically, Perl 6 has data dumper built right into the language, which is kind of useful too. Yeah, I like that too. When I run that, you'll see that what it's actually doing is it's representing each of these values as a rational number. And the reason it's doing that is because we built the numbers out of a division of integers, so it uses rational numbers. And in Perl 6, the rational numbers are arbitrary precision rational numbers, therefore the calculation never goes wrong. The only time you get rounding is when it's printing it out as a decimal. Now. Not that you couldn't do the same thing in Perl 5. But what you wouldn't want to do is say just use big num. Because if you use big num, indeed it does get closer to the correct answer, <laughs> but it's still going wrong. What you have to use in Perl 5 is a built-in called big rat. And somehow, you know, <laughs> Perl community, we suck at marketing. This does not help. Oh yeah, you can fix the Bernoulli numbers, but you have to use a big rat to do it. <laughs> so what is it that Perl 6 offers to beginners? Well, for a start, it offers them a cleaner syntax. Just a simple syntactic cleanup that's simpler to understand. But maybe more importantly, it offers cleaner semantics. More do what you meanness. And so I was thinking about semantics and beginners, and that naturally leads me to this guy, Alan Turing. Famous, of course, for inventing the Allen machine. <laughs> which would have gone much, much better if he'd called it the I-tape infinity. <laughs> so uh, you all know the Turing machine. You know, you've got a tape, you can write on it, you can read from it, you've got states to move. I love the Turing machine. You can build a Turing machine out of just about anything. You can build it out of Meccano. You can build it out of Lego. You can build it out of Excel. <laughs> but my favorite implementation of the Turing machine was the person who implemented it 
in the template system of C++. <laughs> Not in C++, in the template system. So there are no executable statements in this Turing machine. You compile it and the Turing machine runs. In other words, the template mechanism of, of C++ is Turing complete, which tells you everything you need to know about C++. <laughs> so I thought, what would a Turing machine look like in Perl 6? This is the complete implementation for it. So a Turing machine needs five bits of information. You need to tell me what state to start in. You need to tell me what the rules of transition are. You need to tell me where the head is going to be, what the tape looks like initially, and when I should stop. And then you go into a big infinite loop, and you print out the current state of the tape. And then if you're in the halt state, you finish. And otherwise, you update what's under the read, uh, under the head position and in the tape, what the state is now, and do you move the head left or right? And the only bit of this that's not actually about the algorithm itself is these last two lines. And the problem here is, in Perl 5 and Perl 6, we've got these unbounded arrays, which we all love because they're incredibly useful, but they're only semi-unbounded. They're only semi-infinite. So if you happen to move the head off the start of the tape, if you want to simulate an infinite tape, then you've got to move everything down and move the head back on. And that's what those two lines are doing. And they're exactly the same as if you did them in Perl 5. Now, some things that I like about this from the language point of view is that in Perl 6, we have an incredibly advanced mechanism for specifying the signature of a subroutine. You can do all kinds of amazing things. Probably the most useful is you can create a subroutine whose parameters are named parameters. And that's what the colons in front of those parameters are for. It says these are named parameters, which means when you call them, you have to call them with a name in front of them. And anyone who's written large-scale code knows this is the way to write parameter calls if you possibly can. Because in six months' time, you come back and you remember these. And more importantly, when someone comes back and says, oh, we should alphabetize them or something like that, and changes the order, name parameters don't care. The name tells it which variable to go into, so it always works. You don't have to remember the order of things. And as I get older, not having to remember the order of things becomes increasingly valuable to me. But there's more to this as well. In most languages that have named parameters, the named parameters are optional. And they are in Perl 6 as well, but you can also make them required. And you do this just by screaming them. <laughs> State, rules. If you don't like to scream, then you can just say they are required. But that's more fun. <laughs> Normally, as in Perl 5, Perl 6 parameters are passed as aliases. But sometimes what you want is a copy of the thing that you can mess around with and not destroy the original argument. So you can say in Perl 6 very easily, I want a copy. In Perl 5, you have to actually manually copy it into a variable yourself. This makes that easy. And of course, for the optional arguments, it's also nice if they can have defaults and they can have defaults. By the way, you get that in Perl 5 now, as long as you're using Perl 5.20 and later. So, very cool mechanism for creating really nice APIs to your subroutines. And then other cool stuff. I never want to have to write while one or for Dracula again. And I don't have to. I love the fact that in Perl 6, almost anything that you'd want to interpolate into a double quoted string, including a method call on an array which calls another method to map the values, just works. And that's all just inter interpolated into the string. What this is doing is it's saying, give me the tape, give me the key and values of the tape, that is position and value. And if the position is at the head position, draw the cell with the square brackets around it, and otherwise don't draw it with the square brackets around it. And when I show you this running, you'll see that makes the head position visible on the tape. You're going to love it. I love the fact that when I want to sleep for one-tenth of a second, I can just say sleep for one-tenth of a second without having to load in a module. Or forget to load in the module and then have it round down to zero. I love the fact that hashes you can look up 
with a percentage left on the front. So here I'm looking up in the rule hash for a particular state and a particular thing under the head, or if I can't find anything under the head, then just for the empty space, give me the rule for that, which will be a nested hash eventually. And if that doesn't work, fail. Now I could have written die there, but die is very intense. <laughs> fail says, yeah, die, but make it savable which is very, very cool as well. So if I look up my rule, then I want to look in this little hash that I've found and find out what to do on the tape, what to do with the state, and what to do with the head. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look up three entries in that hash. But to have the hash available to me, I want to given it. And it's just like Perl 5, given says, make that hash that I've looked up dollar underscore. So now I look up the hash and I do it in a way that you've probably not even imagined before. In Perl 6, if you want to default to dollar underscore, you can still do so, but you just can't do so magically. So in Perl 6, none of the built-ins default to dollar underscore, because in Perl 5, only 40% of the built-ins default to dollar underscore, and how many know exactly the 40%? I'm watching Larry not put his hand up either. <laughs> so in Perl 6, if you want to default to dollar underscore, you say dot in front of the thing, because that's the same as saying, look up the method on the object that's in dollar underscore. And that object is a hash, so I do a hash lookup. Now, you'll note that I'm using angle brackets rather than curlies. I could still use curlies, but in Perl 6, curlies don't auto quote. And that's actually a feature, not a bug. Because if you've ever done auto-quoting in Perl 5 when you didn't mean to, you'll realize that it's kind of nice that we have a separate notation that just looks it up. Now, the thing is, in these rules, there might not be any instruction to write something on the tape. There might not be a state change. So we also have to say, only do that if we've defined something in this particular hash that tells me what to write or what state to go into. So in other words, I'm going to look up something to write onto the tape, if it's there, look up something to change the state, if it's there, and I'm going to look up something to see if there's a move to make, and I'm just going to add it to the head position. So all the moves are relative in a Turing machine, move left, move right. Of course, if they haven't got anything there, it'll be move undef, which will go to zero, and I won't care. But the problem is, this pattern is very, very common. I want to assign something, but only if the something is defined. Now, there is not an operator to do that. There's not in Perl 5 either. If you're thinking of the slash slash equals, that's not what slash slash equals does. But I like this pattern. Only do the assignment if the thing you're assigning is there. Kind of makes sense. So I thought, I would like to have that available all the time. Well, Perl 6 makes that incredibly easy. OK. <laughs> so how do I make that a permanent part of my language? Well, the answer is I factor it out up here, assign the R value if the R value is defined, and I write myself a new operator, one that's never been seen before. So the name of that operator is assign. It takes an L value, which is read-writable. It takes an R value, which is only readable. And it assigns the R value to the L value if the R value is defined. And now, down here, I can just say assign to write, assign to state. And it's just available to me. So when I run that, There's a Turing machine. The Turing machine, one of the very first ones that Alan Turing did himself, which was the one that duplicates its own input. But my favorite one is not that one. It's this next one, which has got a, quite a few rules to it. But when you run it, that sort in Turing machine. 
Is that not awesome? Unfortunately, it's not awesome because it's bubble sort. <laughs> we want awesome sorts like quick sort. Now, if I'm going to talk to you about the history of quicksort, you're probably expecting me to put up a picture like this and saying, this guy invented it in 1640. But that's not what happened. Quicksort was invented by this guy in 1959. It's really new technology. Now, 1959 was about the era when John McCarthy was inventing Lisp. So naturally, what I want to do to you is show you quicksort in Lisp. But you know what? That's not quicksort in Lisp. That, ladies and gentlemen, is quicksort in Perl 6. <laughs> and you say, hang on a minute, I'm pretty sure that we don't have car and coulda. And yeah, right, I had to write it. But I wrote it basically in Lispish Perl 6. And what I love about this language more than perhaps anything else is if you are coming from a Lisp or a Scheme background and you want to write code that feels comfortable and familiar in the way that you want to write it, it's perfectly possible to do. If you're coming from an imperative background and you want to write quicksort in the standard kind of shift off the pivot and grep out the before and after and recursively sort them, then you can do that as well. And if you're coming from a Haskell background where you're not allowed to have any variables and you want a pure functional implementation using multiple dispatch and destructuring arguments, if there's no, nothing in the list, return nothing. If there's one thing in the list, return one thing. If there's more than one thing in the list, do the recursive algorithm. Well, that works too. This is an awesome language. You can code the way that you want to. Now, I have to say, if I'm talking about beginners, beginners generally don't favor quick sort. If you ask a beginner to implement a sort algorithm, they will tend to go for a non-deterministic algorithm. <laughs> Typically, they'll go for BOGO sort. Are you familiar with BOGO sort? The principle of BOGO sort is very simple. I give you a, a set of cards, a deck of cards, and I say, sort this for me. You do it like this. You shuffle the deck of cards and check whether it's sorted. If it's not, you shuffle the deck of cards and then check whether it's sorted. If it's not, you shuffle the deck of cards and then check with it, and eventually it will be sorted. <laughs> and that's this algorithm. In other words, until the list is in order, pick from the list all of the elements at random. The star just means all of them. That's kind of shuffle built into the language. And put it back in the list, and then check whether it's in order again. This is a fantastically simple algorithm. You can implement this very, very quickly in C. And eventually, it will be sorted, and then you just return the list. OK, it's about the simplest sort algorithm that's available. Um, we can optimize it a little bit. In Perl 6, when you have variable equals variable operator whatever, you don't write that. You'd never write x equals x plus 7. You'd write x plus equals 7. Well, you can do that with method calls as well in Perl 6. You can just say list call equals pick. In other words, pick every element out of this list and put it back in the list. It's kind of cool. The other thing is, where do I get this in order from? Oh, by the way, in Perl 6, you can use hyphens in identifiers. Isn't that nice? Bringing the 60s technology to you. How would I implement in order? Well, the thing that I love most about implementing in order is in Perl 6, you can implement in order in fewer characters than it takes to write in order. That's in order in Perl 6. Perl 6 has an after operator, which you can put between two values, and it'll tell you which, uh, whether the first one is after the second. It has a not meta operator, which you can apply to after, to say, OK, I want it to not be after the second. And it has square brackets, which you can put around the operator to turn it into a list operator. So it effectively says, 
put that operator between every single element. And if the first element is not after the second element, and the second is not after the third, and et cetera, et cetera, that's a sorted list. Now you might say, okay, but that's kind of scary. I much prefer to see in order. Fine, write a subroutine. <laughs> and yeah, you can still use add underscore if you want to. Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> so when you run that, sure enough, it'll sort a list. And sometimes it sorts it quickly, and sometimes <laughs> it sorts it less quickly. So that's not an ideal algorithm or an ideal use for non-determinism. Is there any actual useful use for non-determinism? And it turns out that there is. You can use non-determinism to detect prime numbers. So how does a beginner write a prime number checker? They write it something like this. Go through all the numbers for 2 to the square root of n, and if the number is evenly divisible by the divisor, then it ain't a prime. And if you go through all the numbers and none of them were, then it is a prime. A couple of things to note there. Perl 6 has an is evenly divisible by. So you don't have to write n mod divisor equals 0. It also has a true and false value, which is canonical. So we run that particular algorithm, and sure enough, it finds prime numbers. But as the prime numbers get longer, it does less and less well. So another beginner had a go at prime number detection. This guy. This is Pierre de Fermat, known to you as Fermat. And in 1640, he released his little theorem. And his little theorem gives us a way of very probably detecting primes. So the algorithm basically looks like this. You pick a number between 2 and n. You do a calculation on it. And if it gives you a certain answer, then it's composite. Otherwise, it's probably prime. So in other words, you take a random number that you want to say, is that prime or not? You choose another random number less than it, and you raise that number to the original number minus 1, which gives you a very large number, which you then mod by the original number. And if that turns out to be 1, then it's prime, probably. <laughs> so if you take a composite number and you do the same, pick a random number less than it, Subtract 1 there, you get an even bigger number in this case. Mod it by the original, you get 36. And so we have detected, with only a huge amount of calculation, that 86, no, 68 is not prime. So the problem here, of course, is that probably. There are certain numbers for which that relationship doesn't work. So people came to Fermat and said, there are certain numbers for which that relationship doesn't work, Pierre. And he said, I don't care, look at this. <laughs> and he said, if you do it 100 times with different random numbers, the probability of it not being prime goes way, 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 way down. So that algorithm basically looks like this. Do it for 100 times, pick an RJ, and do the same sort of thing there. Now, you may have noticed a couple of things here. For a start, in Perl 6, it's incredibly easy to pick a random number in a range. You write the range, and then you say, pick. No more doing that mental reverse calculation on rand to get the right range. But more importantly, Perl 6's source code is Unicode. So if you're having a Perl 6 identifier, it can be any valid Unicode character, including subscripts. There is no rational reason to use this feature. <laughs> except how wonderful it is. Is that not glorious? Also note that Perl 6 has a lot of built-ins. It has a built-in that takes a number, raises it to a power, and then mods it by a number. 
And it turns out that's actually a very useful thing to be able to do because if you take a big number and raise it to the power of a big number, you get a huge great big number and then modding it is really, really slow. This uses an algorithm that doesn't build huge numbers, it does interim calculations and it's very, very fast. You could do it that way, of course it would look very pretty, but this is actually faster. So when we run this, now it turns out that we can factor the, uh, find that these numbers are prime very, very quickly. So that's great, that would be a terrific algorithm for us to use if it weren't for this guy. The villain of the piece here, this is Robert Carmichael, British mathematician, after whom a certain set of numbers are named the Robert, no, no the Carmichael numbers. And the Carmichael numbers break Fermat's prime number tester. So, in 1976, Gary Miller, and in 1980, Michael Rabin improved upon a new algorithm that is impervious to this. And it's basically the old algorithm with some trickery involved. And most of the trickery involved says, once I've found a trial that was OK, I'm now going to go from 1 up to but excluding R. And here, the rest of the minus 1s disappear from the language. And then I'm going to square a number. Yep. <laughs> now, in the continental United States, it's probably illegal to use that. But in the rest of the world, where we can actually access Unicode on our keyboards, that is so amazingly cool. So if we run this algorithm, it's really good at doing it. It's really, really quick. And in fact, the most amazing thing about this algorithm implementation in Perl 6 is that it still works if you do this. No, that's not some stupid modular that I've released that just bleaches your source code. Perl 6 has an is prime built into the language and it uses the Rabin Miller prime tester. So at this point you're probably thinking to yourself, nobody cares about primes. <laughs> and that's true, it's absolutely true, nobody does, but guess what, everybody cares about prime factors, and by everybody I mean the NSA and the CIA and now apparently the FBI too. And in 1973, this guy, Clifford Cox, invented public key cryptography. No one knew at the time, because the Brits keep things pretty close to their chests. But you all know public key cryptography? Based on a fairly simple principle. And that simple principle is, you've got two big numbers, it's relatively quick to add them, to, to multiply them together, to get an even bigger number. But if you've got an even bigger number and you want to find the numbers that it was built from, that's comparatively slow to do. And if your number is big enough, it's so slow that you're not going to do it in the rest of the time of the universe. Has. So the question is, well, given a number, how does a beginner factor it? And the beginner's algorithm for factoring a number looks pretty much like this. You take all of the numbers between 2 and the square root of n, which are all the possible factors, you make a list of them. And then you go into a loop and for each of those factors, you try dividing the number evenly by that divisor. And if it does divide, then you take that number and keep it, because it's a good number. And what that take does is feeds the surrounding gather block. So in Perl 6, we have this tool built in whereby as you take these values, the gather block collects them. At the end, the gather block returns them. So this is like a generalized do block. You know, in a do block, you just get the last statement back. In a gather take, you get as many takes as you want. So you take that number, you divide the number by it, giving you a smaller number to deal with, and then you keep trying the divisors. And if the divisor doesn't work, you get rid of it until you get to the point where you've gone through all the divisors. And then whatever you've got left in n is going to be a prime number, or 1. So then you take all of the numbers, 
and n, and you flatten that all down. In Perl 6, arrays as parts of lists don't naturally flatten. You have to do it manually. And that way is kind of annoying, but it also means you can have lists of lists of lists. So we take those, we feed them through grep, because we only want the ones that are two or bigger, and then, just for convenience, we sort them. The sort's not required, but it's kind of nice to get them back in a sorted order. What I like about this is that's concurrent programming. The things on the left-hand side get fed into the calculation on the right-hand side, and if that calculation on the right-hand side is capable of it, it will start processing them even before the left-hand side is finished. Pipelining, right in the language. If you don't care about the concurrency, just like the fact that you can say, do this, then do that, then do that in the correct order. So, if I run that, then sure enough, it starts factoring my numbers. But not really very quickly. And in fact, I'm not even going to bother to keep on with this one because that's never going to finish. So this is another place where non-determinism can help us. So here's the non-deterministic version of that. The non-deterministic version says, choose a random factor of n. I don't care which one it is, just find me one. And what I'll do then is I'll find the prime factors of that, so I'm breaking the problem down. And I'll also find the f prime factors of n uh, divided by that, which is the other main factor of it. And so I'm doing this <coughs> recursive implementation. And then you do a stupid thing where you just say, loop, checking random numbers to see if they're factors and if they are, return them. This is about as dumb as it gets, but surprisingly, Well, no, it's not faster. It would be very surprising if, in fact, it was faster. It's not faster at all because it's stupid. <laughs> Except when it is faster, and then it's very impressive. Okay, you know, if you luck out like 10 times in a row, then it's really fast. But once people got hooked on this idea, there was no letting go of it. The whole idea was, very simple algorithm, I've just got to find better ways of finding random factors. So what people did is they started using horrible, horrible number theory to refine their guess of the random number. And the current sort of leader for this is a guy called John Pollard. Now. There is no picture on the entire internet of John Pollard, so I just put up Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> um, for a start, he's very good looking, but more importantly, I kind of think that after working out the algorithm that I'm about to show you, this is probably how John Pollard felt. <laughs> so, Pollard invented something called the row factorization, and it's called row factorization because he couldn't get away with calling it convergent iterated smart guessing. <laughs> so, the basic principle is you have to find a random factor of n, so you're going to use some kind of horrible number theory. Here is the horrible number theory that he uses, and again, I'm not going to go through the algorithm with you. You can look it up on Wikipedia if you want to know the gory details of it. All I want to show you is it's called row factorization because it uses a coefficient row in it, which of course is a valid alphabetic character in the Unicode set so I can have dollar row. And that's the only reason I want to show you this whole damn thing. <laughs> Except of course, to also make the point that this algorithm requires you at one point to find the greatest common divisor of two numbers. And guess what? That's built into the language as well. And not even as a function, it's built in as an infix operator. Is that not awesome? Because then you can put square brackets around it and find the greatest common divisor of all the numbers. But the thing I love most about this is that I can write xi equals xi squared plus 1 mod n. <laughs> and you might think, well, why is that helpful? It's helpful because if you have an algorithm, now you can just 
transcribe it into your Perl source, and it executes. I love that. I think that's fantastic. So if we have a look at this algorithm running, it's really, really impressive. So I actually decided I was going to factor a whole lot of numbers for you. Is that awesome or what? Now, don't get too excited. <laughs> I've only got an hour, so that one's not going to finish either. And this brings up the fundamental problem. This is kind of a kick-ass algorithm for factoring in a traditional sort of way. But it doesn't matter that it is, because it doesn't matter how set theoretic you get, you still don't get to polynomial time. All of these algorithms are non-polynomial time, which means that when you try and extend them out to reasonable sizes that you might use in an actual encryption algorithm, you might as well, you're going to need another universe to do it in. And that was true right up to 1994, when this guy, Peter Shaw, published the first polynomial time algorithm for factoring a number using quantum computation. Now, I will say at this point, Shaw's algorithm for quantum factoring is not for beginners. <laughs> so I do not propose to show it to you this morning. Um, oh, I, I'll show it to you. But that's all I'm going to do. But the thing I'd say is, yeah, sure, it's not for beginners. But you know what? Quantum computing really is for beginners. And I want to prove that to you in the last 15 minutes or so that I have. It really is good for beginners. So here's a crash course on quantum computing. Suppose I have a result, an outcome, that could be in one of two possible values. I might get a 1, I might get a 2. And maybe they're like 50% likely each. Using quantum technology, I can actually create a single value that is 50% likely to be observed as 1 and 50% likely to be observed as 2. Now, of course, it's not going to be observed as 1 and 2. It's going to be a little tiny quantum particle which is going to be observed as spin up or spin down. But it doesn't matter because I can call spin up 1 and spin down 2. And then I've got a binary representation and then I can make it anything I like. Now, suppose I had a second possible outcome for a second observation, and that was that it was very likely to be 3 and just a little bit likely to be 2. Well, now I can create a system, a quantum system, that represents that as well. And of course, the interesting thing is there are also operations that I can do in a quantum system that simulate the behavior of a plus. So when I add maybe 1 or maybe 2 to maybe 2 or maybe 3, then I get all possible combinations of the outcome. I get very low probability of 3, reasonable probability of 5, and it's much more likely to be 4. And the reason it's much more likely to be 4 is because it could be 1 and 3 or 2 and 2. And you put those together, and now you've got something that will almost certainly collapse to 4, but sometimes it won't. And what do you do then? you get yourself an observer to have a look. And so the observer comes and has a look. <laughs> and at that point, it collapses down into a particular value. And it collapsed down into five. It was a bit unlikely, but it happened. Now, the interesting thing about that is, as soon as it collapses, then all of the values that were involved in creating that value must collapse to consistent values. And that means that without anyone looking at anything else, those things from now on are going to have to be 2 and 3, because that's the only way I could have observed 5. And otherwise, it would be a paradox, and the entire universe would unzip. <laughs> so that's cool. But what would have happened if Leo had happened to observe 4? Well, if he'd happened to observe 4, then these two things could not collapse because there were two different ways that he could have observed for, and therefore the probabilities are not certain yet. So the only way we can work out what those values are is for him to go and observe one of them 
and he might observe it as three, and then the other one will have to be two. It will automatically collapse. And the basis of quantum computation is the fact that I can observe one thing and it will make other things happen consistently without any extra work involved. And the other thing is it's reversible. It's working backwards. We looked at the result, but we were able to find the components that produced that result automatically. And of course, that's exactly what we want to do when you have a big number that's a result, and we want to find the two factors that made that result. So I obviously, what I was going to do, it's not built into Perl 6. <laughs> Some quantum technology is built in, in the form of junctions, but not this. So I wrote a module called quantum computation. If I had an extra half hour, I would show you that module because I'm so proud of it. It's all based on the multiple worlds theory. And it reads like a treatise on multiple worlds. It's just lovely. But you can't see it, so I'm just going to show you the results. So the results are, you get these state things where you say, OK, I'm in state 1 with a probability of 0.5. I'm in state 2 with a probability of 0.5. If I add them together, then I get one of these superpositions, which is half 1 and half 2. And then I do the same thing with different probabilities for 2 and 3. And having got those things, then I can add them together. And now I get a result z that's going to be one of those values. So this is exactly replicating the diagram that I showed you before. And when I observe z, it will collapse. And more importantly, so too will x and y if they can collapse. If they can't, they will stay uncollapsed until we observe them. So this really does replicate the actual behavior of quantum mechanics and could, in fact, be ported to a real quantum computer. Now, the only thing about that is, if you port it to a quantum computer, then the physicists who have to use the quantum computer will not understand this notation because they have their own weird notation called the Ket notation. And a quantum physicist would write it like that. And of course, how hard is that in Perl 6? It's a one-liner. So here we go, our two states adding up to z. I also added a thing that you can't have in quantum computing, which is look at the states without actually looking at them. <laughs> this is the eye of God. <laughs> but it's very handy for, for debugging. So I'm going to show you what the unobserved z looks like in superposition. Then I'm going to observe the z just by printing it. And then I'm going to show you what x and y look like after I did that. And then I'm going to observe y and so forth. So what happens when I do that? Well, the unobserved is in the states of different superposition. When I observe 4, x and y are still in superposition. Because 4 could have been made in one of two ways. But when I observe y, now x can only be 1, and it's already collapsed before I observed it. If we run exactly the same code again, damn, we get exactly the same outcome. Hang on, try again. There, we get a different outcome. Now, z was observed to be 3, not a very high probability event. But now, x and y have already collapsed before either of them have been observed, because that's the way the universe has to work. So that's cool, but it gets an awful lot cooler as soon as you add in one extra quantum operation known as a quantum switch. And the quantum switch comes from an idea by Erwin Schrodinger, who I think qualifies as the scariest looking physicist of all time. <laughs> so you all know about Schrodinger's cat. This was a thought experiment, which is if you take a radioactive particle and a Geiger counter and a container of cyanide and a cat and you put them all in a box, scariest physicist of all time, 
and you hook it up so that if the particle randomly decomposes, the Geiger counter detects it and trips the cyanide canister to release the cyanide, thereby making the cat very unhappy. And if it doesn't trip because it didn't decompose, then the cat's still very unhappy. No, actually, the, <laughs> the cat's pretty happy because it's in a box, right? So Schrodinger's point was, if this random event is determining the outcome for the gas and for the cat, then until someone observes that system internally, then the cat is actually in a superposition of alive and dead. And the thing is, when Schrodinger was making this experiment, he was using it to say how ridiculous he thought quantum mechanics was. But unfortunately, this is correct. This is the way it works. <laughs> And we can prove that in Perl 6 with code. So you use the module quantum computation. You set up a system where the probability that the particle decayed is true is a half, and false is a half. Then you say, well, what is the gas state? Well, the gas state depends on what the particle did. So you say, well, suppose that the particle decay was true or false, then the gas must be either released or contained. If it's true, it'll be released. If it's false, it'll be contained. So if you're trying to understand what this supposed thing is, it's basically like, given this particle, when it's true, released, when it's false, decayed. Or if you want to think even more simply, it's like a ternary operator. This is the quantum ternary operator. Now, in Perl 6, we change the syntax of the ternary operator because single question mark and single colon were just too uh, valuable to waste on ternary operators. So if the particle decayed, become released if it's contained. Except it doesn't do it by observing the particle. It does it by not observing the particle. So the result is you get a state where it's 0.5 released and 0.5 contained. We don't know yet. So this is kind of the blind ternary operator. And then, of course, the cat's state depends on the gas's state in exactly the same way. So if the gas was released, the cat is dead. If the gas was contained, the cat is alive. And once again, it does that in such a way that you end up with these chains of associations of the possible outcomes. So what do we do then? We observe the cat. We open the box, see what the cat is. And when we do that, the observation causes the cat's state to collapse to one absolutely certain value, unless we are also in a closed box. <laughs> and when it collapses like that, then the values on which it depended and the technical term is the values on w with which it's entangled, must also collapse to a consistent set of values. So when I observe these other two things, I will only get that. So if I show you this, here I have it. I'm going to run it seven times in the hope of getting different outcomes. And the very first time I run it, I'm going to show you what the uncollapsed states are, just so you can see. And when we run that, you get this. Initially, they are in these uncollapsed states. If the cat's dead, then you always get released and decay. If it's alive, then you always get contained and did not decay. And there's no possibility of getting any other combination. Once you've observed one part of the system, the rest of the system is determined. OK, so that's great for party tricks by psychopathic Germans. But you know what? It's actually great for real work, too. So remember this thing? We had the random prime factor we had to find, and we're going to do it by eliminating invalid candidates using horrible number theory. Well, guess what? You can do it instead by eliminating entire universes using horrible quantum mathematics. So the whole algorithm looks like this. That's it. You say the following. 
you say entangle all the numbers between 2 and the square root of n. And that's just an easy way of saying give me all the possible numbers between 2 and the square root of n, each with an equal probability of 1 over n. But I got sick of writing that, so I just made an entangle function that does that for you. And that will be your factor. So in other words, take all possible factors and just mix them all together, equiprobably. And then, of course, your modulus that you're looking for, which we'd like to be 0, is just going to be n divided by that. And when I'm doing an operation on a quantum value, I end up with another quantum value. And I get the superposition of all the possible moduli in that variable. And then I do the quantum switch. I say, suppose the modulus is 0, then it truly can be a, prior, a factor. And if it's not 0, I don't care about it. Mu in Perl 6 is an undefined value. In fact, it is the um, parent of all undefined values. It's the most undefined value. <laughs> in Zen terms, it is the nothing from which everything proceeds. And what this means in quantum mechanics is we're saying anything other than zero is an impossible state, therefore eliminate that universe. I also need the factor to be prime because I need a random prime factor. So I say, call the built-in is prime function, and if it turns out to be true, then that's okay, and otherwise, I'm doing mu for you. <laughs> now, it turned out that when I was writing different algorithms using this module, wanting to eliminate 99% of the universes, and who hasn't wanted to do that, <laughs> was so common that I just made it the default. So be very careful with the quantum switch operator. <laughs> and having set up all of those constraints, then all you have to do is observe the factor. Literally by treating it as a number. In Perl 6, if you want something to definitely be a number, you put a plus in front of it, and then it is observed to be a number. And that will cause all of those entangled superpositions to collapse down to a consistent arrangement that meets all the criteria. And sure enough, here it is. Um, oh, just by the by, um, it, uh, the module also provides a universe block which can, you can separate it off from other universes just in case. <laughs> and when you run it, it factors Numbers, just like that. Now, I haven't even started optimizing this. The module itself is set up so if I was doing it concurrently, it would run very much faster. I just didn't do it yet, but I'm going to get there. The thing I like most about this is if you look at this algorithm, it's really just a description of what we want. The factor has to be between 2 and the square root of n. The modulus has to be n mod the factor. The modulus has to be 0. And the factor has to be prime. And now, solve for the factor. That's, that's kind of just the ultimate description of what we want without any coding at all. You know what? I could actually, with very little effort, make Perl 6 work exactly like that. Literally, all I did was say, any of just entangled states required is just a quantum switch and solve for just collapses the superposition. And so that, ladies and gentlemen, is pure declarative quantum factorization <laughs> for beginners. And here's one of the giants on whose shoulders we all stand. And it's been my privilege over the last two decades 
to work with Larry to help him create this amazing new language, Perl 6. And all of that time, he has had a very, very clear focus about what he wanted for that language and what it is that beginners in programming really need. They need languages that have the right tools already built in, and Perl 6 has more of that than just about any language. But they also, at the same time, need languages that get out of your way, that don't overload you with syntax and with syntactic inconsistencies. And Perl 6 has that in a way that Perl 5, frankly, doesn't. We've known for a long time that Larry has liked languages that let you do what you mean, where you write something and it does the right thing. And I think I've demonstrated today, Perl 6 allows you to do that very, very powerfully, even if you're a beginner. But equally important has always been his belief that beginners need languages that do the right thing as well. And Perl 6 is really a high watermark for that. Because it's not just about doing the right thing, it's about making it easy to do the right thing. To make the thing that you would naturally do, do the right thing. So my claim for you today is that if you are a beginner, then what beginners need is to be learning Perl 6. It's an amazing language. And the great thing about that is, it's only been out for like about six months. So for most of us, we're all Perl 6 beginners. So can I leave you with a thought that now is the time to begin. Go to perl6.org, go to rakudo.org, download, play, learn. It's a great language. I promise you, you'll be glad you did. So thank you very, very much. Okay, so we're, uh, we're going to take a break. Uh, if anybody's interested, uh, Jamie is always looking for some good gigs. He does a lot of uh, rec uh, consulting work, and uh, he's a great asset for any company. We're going to take, take a break right now, and we'll come back for the breakout sessions at 1.30. Thank you. <laughs>